Hi, my name is Kathy. I am an embalmer and I have been for about seven years now. I'm also a cremationist, so my day may be doing embalmings and cremations. Um, typically a day would be coming back to the prep room and facing maybe an autopsy. And if you've never seen an autopsy, it is where the Y incision has to be opened up. And also there is a cranial suture in the back of the head that needs to be opened up. At that point, you would remove the cranium. You would open the Y incision, take out all the viscera, put it in a separate container to be treated, and then proceed to doing the actual embalming of the inside. Um, there are a lot of things that you have to face first thing in the morning. They're really unpleasant, but that's part of the job of being an embalmer. Um, the, not only the sights and the sounds are something that you have to deal with. That's part of your job. Is bad as much as it's going to trigger your gag reflex. It's something that you just have to push on. You have to focus on what you're doing and deal with it. If you have a, um, a normal embalming, what you would do the first thing is put the body on the table and shave the person, um, put in eye caps. You would close the mouth. There's two different ways of doing that. You can do it either with a needle injector or you can do the old-fashioned method of sewing the mouth shut. Um, what in that involves is taking a long piece of thread, going in the inside of this lip up into this right nostril, across into the left nostril, down inside the lip, down inside the mandible, and on the other side of the mandible, and then you tie it shut. That's kind of the old-fashioned way. Um, after that, you would make your incision. I'm, I'm making this kind of short. It's a lot more involved than this. Your incision is usually above the right clavicle. You're first lifting the right carotid and that's where you're going to be injecting from and you inject down. You drain from the right femoral. Um, this instrument here is what you would stick in the right femoral and that opens, keeps the vein open, especially because right away the blood is going to clot. It's one of the first things that kind of breaks down. So you, you're going to have those clots that are going to restrict your flow. Then you're going to this is an embalming machine. You're going to embalm down into that right carotid. In a normal case scenario, um, the blood will totally drain out of the femoral, except for in the body cavity. The second part to embalming is cavity embalming, and that's where you take a, a very thick, long needle, in essence, is what it is. It's, it's called a trocar, and that gets stuck into the body cavity. It works on a water suction system, and you have to try to get as much fluid out of the body cavity as possible, and then after that, you inject a cavity fluid. Um, in a normal case scenario, this may take between 45 minutes to an hour, and if there's problems, there's a lot of variables. You might have a person that was on certain medications where the embalming fluid isn't going to want to work right. Um, sometimes the body can blow it a little bit. The main thing is to constantly watch and make sure that as things change or if things are going okay, you're keeping on top of it and that it, you can make changes if necessary in your embalming fluid. After the embalming is complete, you have to re-aspirate the body cavity and that's to make sure that you're getting rid of any excess fluid. Um, once you're done with that, you have to treat any kind of incisions to make sure there isn't any leaking. You want to put a, uh, it's called a sealant, on any incisions and also the small hole that the trocar makes in the abdomen. Um, we then glue the eyes shut and the mouth and we put as minimal amount of makeup as possible. We don't like to put a lot of makeup on. Um, in the old days, you would see bodies that had a lot of pancake caked on makeup, and I think we're trying to get away from that. We're trying to make the deceased look as natural as possible. Um, if that's not possible, you may have cases of extreme jaundice where 
the face is going to be green or yellowy green and you have that in uh, liver failure but if that's the case you have to use a lot of makeup and there's ways that you can use a lot of makeup and try to make it look natural and that's our goal try to make it look as natural as possible um, you have to dress the deceased and this is done with as much dignity as possible we treat all of our cases as we would a family member we're very protective these people deserve dignity even after death and that's what we try to give them and I'm also a cremationist so there may be days where I have to do one or two embalmings and then go do a cremation and the crematory process what we do is we take the deceased he goes in a special box called a cremation container that container is then rolled into the retort which is in essence the crematory and this is the oven part is called the retort and it's basically it works the same way as a kiln oven um, the process takes about two and a half to three hours and once the cremation is done you would take all this all that remains is the bones everything else tissue fluids all is pretty much incinerated and all you're left with are bones the bones are then taken out of the retort put into what we call a processor the processor is a tray with a container underneath and then what you're doing is you're crushing the bones and this has two purposes I mean you are physically crushing them this is to get all the metal out because you don't want the metal in that processor it's gonna it's gonna ruin it and also to release heat that builds up inside of those bones once you're done with that you would put them into the processor which is basically a big tub and it has a blade it's kind of like a um, it works the same way as a paint mixer basically and this would this is what turns it into the ash the final product is it's a very fine ash to be an embalmer you have to go to accredited school for two years it's an associate degree in applied science and during that time period or afterward you have to work for a funeral home for a minimum of one year a one-year apprenticeship and then you can obtain a license I know that does vary from state to state the requirements for a cremationist um, seem to vary from state to state in some states you have to take a course in others it seems you have to do some hands-on work and be registered with a accredited cremation crematory I think the best part of the job is when you can take a case that looks absolutely terrible we've had some that were suicides and you're having a hard time covering up the entry or the exit wound but yet the family wants to say goodbye to that person or they want to see them one more time so it's a challenge to cover that up and to make that person look as natural as as you can so they can say goodbye or they can have a little bit of peace they can see them in a peaceful way as they're saying goodbye um, if you can make makeup look natural if you can look make the person look like they're not even wearing makeup and the family comes to you and they make it a point to tell you that and they have tears in their eyes uh, there's just it's the best feeling in the world um, to work with families to be thanked by families for making it just that much easier this is the worst time in their life and and you're making it a little bit easier um, it's wonderful it's it's a gratifying feeling the worst part of the job is sometimes you'll get a little child or an infant and it's extremely difficult to do your job to do the embalming to get through that and to stay focused um, it's also very difficult to see the parents to do the conference with the parents to see the parents at the funeral it's um, it's such a impossible situation and you're sympathizing but you can only sympathize to a point otherwise you can't function you can't uh, get through the embalming you can't get through the funeral and you can't help but wonder how those parents are getting through this and I'm glad it's not me there's a million things that go through your mind um, 
I think first and foremost is you look at that little child or that baby and you feel like this was a life not lived and you can't figure out why or nothing really makes any sense at that point. Um, and it stays with you for a long time. You see that baby at night for a long time. If you're thinking about going into this career, I don't know what to tell you because it's, a, it's almost a calling. It's a weird calling, but it's kind of a calling. I remember wanting to do it in high school and out of high school I got married and started having children and never got around to it. Um, I was in my 40s and I still, for some reason, I couldn't tell you why, still wanted to do this. Um, it's not a morbid thing. It's a, uh, you love anatomy. Um, you have to love anatomy. You have to know the insides of the human body after those two years in order to embalm. And you also have to have um, a, a feeling for people and care about people. It's difficult to deal with people when someone dies. They're very emotional. Sometimes they're angry. Um, sometimes they're just so heartbroken. You don't know what to say. There really is nothing to say. Sometimes all you can do is, is give them a hug and you just want to help them. If you can help them with their loved one being gone as far as the physical things at least you're doing something. Um, you have to have high ethics to go into this job. You should have high ethics to go into this job. It's difficult. It's demanding physically, emotionally. Um, think long and hard about it before you do it.